You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible. All right, folks, while there's an effort to find a vaccine for coronavirus, what about an antiviral drug to stop the virus? Uh, folks at Meharry are working on an antiviral drug uh, in the short term. Joining us right now joining us right now is Dr. Donald Ans Elsindor, Associate Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at Meharry Medical College. So Dr. Elsindor, how are you doing? How are you, sir? Uh, doing great. Okay, so explain to folks who are watching and listening, what is the difference between a vaccine and an antiviral drug? So a vaccine is designed to protect the person before they com- become infected. And so you get a vaccine, you don't have the disease, but the vaccine is given to you to trigger an immune response that will protect you if you become infected in the future. And so a vaccine would do you no good if you're already infected with the disease. And so an antiviral is not to replace a vaccine, but it would be in support of a vaccine, meaning that for those individuals that are infected right now, an antiviral would be useful in that patient as opposed to a vaccine. A antiviral would be less difficult to to, to make, the one we're making takes us only two weeks to generate. However, the testing would be similar to a vaccine in terms of going through all the hurdles required for it to achieve FDA approval and and go on. But uh, we can make an antiviral relatively quickly, the one that I've designed. Okay, so explain uh, to folks the, the one that you designed uh, and how has, it been, how has it been working? So uh, what, we've, what I've designed basically is an antiviral that is specific as opposed to something being nonspecific. So when something is specific, it will go after that particular pathogen and, and no other. And so it's specific in a sense where it targets the genome of the virus. And the genome of the virus is a piece of RNA that the virus released into an infected cell that allows the virus to reproduce itself. So the idea is that to come up with an antiviral that will directly impact virus replication, in my mind, is an, is an ideal strategy. And so as soon as the virus is in the cell, the antiviral is sitting there waiting. And when the, uh, the RNA from the virus, as it goes through an uncoding process, is released, the antiviral impacts the RNA molecule and prevents any other proteins from being made. And if you're able to achieve that in the cell, then you're able to achieve a complete shutdown of virus replication. So when you shut down virus replication, you reduce the amount of virus in the system. If you reduce the amount of virus in the system, you're able to do a lot of things in terms of basically start to reduce the kind of pathology associated with the infection. And in this case, the inflammation that is caused by this virus as, a, as part of the course of infection would be uh, reduced. And if you're able to reduce the amount of virus there, what we call virus load, then you would expect to see Uh, an amelioration of of the kind of pathology and maybe even the symptoms and the disease itself. And of course, cutting virus down substantially in a living system with an antiviral, the possibility of allowing some type of repair of, of, of those tissues that have been damaged could lead to a person being able to clear the virus on their own in a sense the potential to recover quickly on their own. And the idea is to, is to prevent them from going through uh, the issues that go along with being on a ventilator and ICU and so forth. So uh, with, with that, uh, you know, how far away are we? I mean, we hear reports that we may not have a vaccine until 2021 or even 2022. When it comes to this antiviral, uh, how soon are we away for this to be widely disseminated across the country? So I, I want to provide a little information here. 
So when we look at mm-hmm. vaccines in general, looking at the past, there are some professionals that, that look at vaccines and vaccines and how they've developed over the years. And the average time for a vaccine in the past have been 12 to 15 years for them to be basically brought to, identified, brought to scale, and fully implemented in the population. And remember, this vaccine would, be, would have to be global. The idea of probably filling as much as 7, mil, 7 billion uh, uh, doses. And again, nobody knows if you have to go through a boost for a vaccine like this. And so the idea is that our antiviral strategy is something to, to try and do something a little bit quicker here. Uh, first of all, it can be made a lot easier. A vaccine, when you give it to a person, it takes time for the vaccine to generate the kind of immune response that can be protective. I should also say that no vaccine is guaranteed to protect you from infection. And there's evidence that suggests that people uh, that get coronavirus infections in the past often will get those infections again, which suggests that the immunity that's derived from prior infections to coronaviruses may not be fully protected. That would suggest that a vaccine could may not be fully protective as well. And so this is all speculation and we will know when it's done. Now, where are we with our antiviral strategy? So the antiviral has been made. We are in the process of working with our collaborators. And first, when an antiviral is made or any drug, you have to get disclosures protection, meaning that our patent application was filed yesterday. We're in the process of making contact with our collaborators. This antiviral will be tested in a Petri dish first. And so imagine, if you will, we take lung epithelial cells and put them in a Petri dish. We grow these lung epithelial cells in this Petri dish, and we have some that are going to be treated with our reagent, our antiviral, prior to being infected, and others that will be infected straight away. And what we want to know out of that experiment is what is the level of protection that we can induce in those cells that get our antiviral compared to those cells that don't. Now, if we think about what we've done with the Zika virus, we've prepared one of these antivirals for the Zika virus, we were able to show 95% protection of those cells in culture. We expect a similar result with this because this antiviral was made using the same classical platform that we used to produce the Zika antivirus. Now, after achieving uh, protection of cells in a Petri dish, then we go to look at toxicity. The idea is that any drug has to be tested for ability to be toxic to a system, a living system. And this is done in a mouse model you give the mouse high doses versus low doses of your reagent. No infections, just the treatment reagent, just the antiviral. And you ask the question, does this antiviral at a high dose, an abnormally high dose, cause problems in this animal? Problems with the heart, the kidney, you name it, rashes, whatever. And the idea is that if you can come out of those experiments and say, that the antivirus causes minimal discomfort or disease or pathology in this animal, then you're able to go to the next step. And the next step with this will be a survival study in an infection protection model. The infection protection model basically involves putting on board your antiviral in a mouse prior to being infected with the COVID-2 virus and asking another question. And that is, at what level of protection can you give these animals in terms of being able to prevent them from dying or having pathology that's associated with COVID-2 infection? And the idea is that you would want to, first of all, be able to protect them from dying. At the same time, you would want to look at the lungs of these animals and basically confirm that. And at the same time, 
the animals that did not, did not receive a reagent and were given the COVID-2 virus straight away, they should have fulminant pathology. They should die quicker. And, 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 and again, when you look at the histopathology of the lung and other tissues, you should have uh, the kind of pathology that you'd see in humans as well. And that would tell you that you have a relevant animal model for doing this kind of work. And then the next phase, after you've done all of those things, then you would be looking at the possibility of developing an IND application to go to the FDA uh, with the possibility of being approved for phase, early phase one trials. And that's the strategy and that's the process. So I'm, I'm sitting here looking at a CBS News story where they're reporting that um, on a possible breakthrough in work on a COVID-19 vaccine, researchers think it could be widely available in September. You buy that? Not, not traditionally. When you look at vaccines, there are some ways to fast track this. But ask yourself this. How much time would you think it would take for a vaccine to come out of the clinic into a phase one study to follow people over long periods of time to see the kind of ill effects this vaccine would have in them for toxicity in the phase one study? And then over time, establish enough individuals and recruit them for the phase two study. And at the same time, in the phase three study, you would be looking at this in terms of its effectiveness in COVID-19 patients in the clinic. These are all things that are very difficult to do just talking about it. And mm -hmm. the idea of being able to do this in a construct that would allow you to do this in a matter of a few months, to me, is an impossibility. Dr. Donald L. Sindor, Meharry Medical College. We certainly appreciate uh, your knowledge and expertise, and this is one of the reasons why we do this show, uh, to give uh, black doctors and scientists an opportunity to share their knowledge. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen too often on mainstream news, but that's why we do what we do. I appreciate it, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Every single night. We've got some of the top black experts. You're not going to see them on cable news or broadcast news because you swear black people aren't experts when it comes to this health crisis. That's why we have this show and why we do what we do every day on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Joining us right now is retired General Russell Honore. Uh, thanks for his first black surgeon general, Dr. Jocelyn Elders. John Hope Bryan, he is the founder of Operation Hope. Senator Kamala Harris of California. Dr. Sadrina Calder, retired General Lloyd Austin. Congresswoman Karen Bass, Commissioner Omari Hardick. Bureau President in Brooklyn, Eric Adams. Dr. Joseph Graves, America's Wealth Coach, Deborah Owens. Dr. Corey A. Bear, Patel Salt. Uh, Howard University student, Pastor Jamal Bryant, a uh, doctor, uh, Christy McDowell, Benja Ajilore, senior economist at the Center for American Progress, Gilda Daniels, again, author of the book, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America. Four stars, uh, General Kit Ward, Dr. Oliver Brooks, is president of the National Medical Association, the president of the American Medical Association, Dr. Patrice Harris, Joby Benjamin, Dr. Alexia Gaffney, infectious disease specialist, Dr. George is Benjamin, uh, executive director of the American, American Public Health Association, Malcolm Nance, family medicine physician Dr. Jen Caudle, Dr. Tashaka Cunningham, a molecular biologist, Kat Stafford. She's a national race and ethnicity reporter for the Associated Press. Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, uh, who is the president of Howard University, Congresswoman Yvette Clark uh, from the state of New York, William Springs, AFL-CIO economist, uh, Andrea James, executive director of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. All right, let's go to Capitol Hill. Congressman Gregory Meeks, Congresswoman Anybody's Johnson of Texas, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Minnesota Senior. And Amy Klobuchar, mental health clinician, Jamie Singletary, Prince George's County State's Attorney, Aisha Braveboy, as well as Dylan uh, Harry, ACLU Justice Division Strategist. Uh, Dr. Cindy Duke, uh, she is a virologist, Principal Steve Perry of Capital Prep. Health and wellness specialist, Dr. Yolandra Hancock, Desmond Mead, President of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, Cliff Albright, who is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter, Michael Harriet with the group, the Mina McWhorter, founder of Love by the Hand of Dr. Julian Malvo, economist, president, Merida Bennett College. Coroner Michael Fowler is a mayor of Atlanta, Keisha Lance Bottoms, mental health therapist Suzette Clark, Justin Gibney, attorney and political strategist, and Bishop Vincent Matthews Jr., Dr. Suzette McKinney, CEO and executive director of the Illinois Medical District, 
Dr. Leon Madugo, president-elect of the National Medical Association, Jana Bailey. Mayor of Moss Point, uh, Mississippi, uh, Mario King. We're going to keep driving this thing to make sure our people are fully aware, safe, protected from coronavirus. You're getting the top medical experts, the top business experts, top political experts, top religious experts, because that's why we do what we do unapologetically and unfiltered. Ain't nobody else in the black media space doing what we do. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.